for those who are new in Mavuno, about three years ago, we introduced a culture shift. And we didn't change our mission because Mavuno's mission is turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. So that has remained the same. We never changed our vision because our vision is, let me see if you know it, planting a culture-defining churches in every cup of the city of Africa, gateway cities of the world by 2035. We want to plant a, a movement of culture-defining churches across the world. So those things never changed and they will always remain uh, for us. Today I taught you how to become a fearless influencer. That's really what I was teaching you. Because fearless influence is not about shouting I'm fearless, it's about influencing the lives of people. And so we, we've never changed that, we're still doing it. What changed is our strategy and how we are setting out to do it. And we shifted to the place where the biggest change I would say in Mavuno in that time is today our desire is that everybody in Mavuno Church is being discipled by somebody and is discipling somebody else. That would be the simplest way to put the culture shift. But to be honest, it's not been an easy culture shift because culture shift is never easy. I will tell you this for free. Because you're desiring to become leaders of influence, the biggest challenge you will ever face as a leader is changing culture. Can I say that again? The biggest change you will ever face as a leader is changing culture. It's easy to change infrastructure. It's easy to build buildings. It's easy to build roads. I think in Kenya we've had leaders who've been great with infrastructure. And let me not say it's easy. It also takes good leadership to build infrastructure. But to be a phenomenal leader, you have to be a culture changer. And the greatest culture changers, the people I looked at when I, when I think about changed slaves into soldiers, into an army. That's the biggest thing Moses ever did. He changed the mindset of slaves into people who believed they could own land. You know, you might see, think that the biggest thing he did was make people cross the Red Sea and, and uh, take them to a promised land. But the biggest change is that he changed how people think. Because that's the hardest thing you can ever do as a leader. Why? Because people, nobody likes change. Change is threatening. And I speak for all of us as human beings. Change is threatening. So, for you as a leader, just understand, if you want to change your organization, culture change is a place where true leadership is discovered. Uh, if you look at nations that have changed culture, Paul Kagame changed culture. He did. He changed culture. Because that is one African president who entered into his country. It was a shambles and built that into a modern 21st century nation. Whatever you think about him, doesn't matter. This man changed culture. That's the hardest thing, to get people who ha have no sense of nat nationality to become one nation and to have a vision. That's a big thing. I think we can appreciate the president of Rwanda. He's, 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 there's, there's some Rwandan people here. Yeah, this, I'm not making a political statement, I'm making a leadership statement. Yeah. I'll give you one, 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 one leader who I really admire, a Kenyan leader, was President Kibaki. And President Kibaki, he changed culture. He moved Kenyans from the place where they believed they could not do anything, to the place, and they could only run away from their country, to a place where people believed, I can invest in my country. That was a, those of you who are not born in those days, you don't understand. It was a complete mentality shift. Yeah. But I still feel there are some gaps because he didn't change the culture of Kenyans feeling it's me first before my country. That's another level of radical change that is required in this country. That's what's going to end corruption. It's, the laws are important, but there's a culture shift that is needed in this country. So changing culture, why am I talking about this? Because changing culture is hard. And as we've gone through the culture shift, there are many of you maybe who've been hurt, maybe who've had questions, where have things changed, where are things not the way we knew them? And so we want those questions first. Now, there are people who've asked about questions about how do I find a husband uh, in a gather. I mean, those things are important. And if we have time, we'll come to those questions later. But uh, let's first pause on those ones and just talk about the culture shift because I think it's very important. And we want to create just that transparent space in Mavuno where you can ask anything. In fact, pastors should just have a T-shirt written, ask me anything. Yeah, just ask me anything. And if I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know, isn't it? 
because not all of, we're not experts. We're also trying to follow Jesus as faithfully as we can. So I'm going to start uh, by, with the questions you've already sent in. As you send them in, they'll be coming. And sort of as I moderate this, I'll be getting them from the, the media team. So I think you know your pastors from Family Night. Uh, on the left-hand corner, His Grace and Her Glory. Uh, that's our nickname for them. <laughs> they are the campus uh, network pastors for the South network of churches and we are so proud of them uh how many churches in the south network 12 12 churches so it's a it's a massive uh network talking about kingdom influence and then next to them is pastor milton and he is the network pastor for the mashariki network of churches how many churches so far 11 11 churches praise god and then next to him Next to him is Pastor James, Papa Jimmy. He is the network pastor for the Hill City Network of Churches. Hi. Why, why is the volume shifting? Why aren't these people excited? He's also your pastor. Yes, he's all our pastor. And then I'll skip the ever beautiful Pastor Carol. <laughs> and I'll come back to her. But uh, Pastor Kilonzi and Pastor Faith. And they are the, I think there's a competition now. People are, <laughs> uh, and they are the, the, past, the network pastors for the downtown network of churches. And how many churches in it? 16. 16 churches. Praise God. And then on the extreme right, uh, Pastor Godwin and Noel. And <laughs> they are the network pastors for the Lifeway Network. Pastor Gordon is like, I'll pay you. It's okay, thanks. I'll, I'll, the Mpesa is coming. Uh, and they lead how many churches? Six. Six, six networks. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a youngest network. Six churches. And then... Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Hill City. Uh, how many churches, Papa Jimmy? Ten, ten, ten. churches. Eish. Praise God. So there's fruitfulness everywhere. Hey. Amen. And then, of course... Ever beautiful, ever amazing, what a sweetie. <laughs> my, 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 for those who don't know, my second half, my, if Pastor George had been there, ah, no, 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 just stay, just stay, just stay. No. <laughs> but I really love this woman. Uh, I, I, find, I find that she's my soulmate and she makes me complete. I'm grateful to God for her. Pastor Carol. <laughs> How many churches in the movement? 54. <laughs> By God uh, and counting. Yeah. Uh, big shout out to uh, Professor Maggie Gitao, who is watching from the US. She woke up at night to watch this. And uh, anybody else who's watching from other parts of the world, we're so grateful that you can follow the gathering along with us. So I'm going to just ask the questions, and I'm going to throw them out. And what we're doing is just talking about your questions. And um, any of them can be free to answer or to ask, and hopefully we'll see as how many questions we can get through uh, today. So the first question is... Pastor M, who is your tailor? No, no, no. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just completely a lie. I, nobody asked that. Uh, Pastor M, I've been a long time Mavunite. I've loved the church. I was part of a life group. We used to call our groups life groups before we became DGs. Uh, I was part of a life group that worked very well for many years. The switch to DGs, discipleship groups, was very painful because it tore apart our group. I've joined a DG recently, but I'm very reluctant to give myself, lest Mavuno changes its mind once again and breaks the DGs. My question is, why DGs and not LGs? And can I really trust that we will not go through another painful change? Wow. Yeah, who wants to give? No, I can't. You can go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, in this world, there'll always be changes. And at times, the changes that I make never get to get to a place where they favor us. And you realize, even in your own personal life, leave alone this one, which is church. Leave alone your, 
Yes, this one. And you get to your personal life. You'll find that there are many more stages that you get to pass through. But then at the end of it all, we have to get to a place where we make a decision. And as we make the decision, we shouldn't make a decision because of the fear of what is coming ahead of us. For me, how I get to look at it is we might be afraid because we loved the uh, LGs. We've stepped into, into the DGs. But if I choose to look at the positives that, yes, were with the DGs, and the negatives that I purport, I'll find in the DGs. I'll never get to put myself and immerse myself fully into DGs number one, and I'll never receive the benefit that comes with the DGs. So for me, I, I look at it as this is a fear that we have to conquer. And we have to conquer from a place where we say, I want to surrender number one, because paralysis of analysis steps in. And we will never get to to a place where we, we say this is it and we have taken charge of it and we will overcome it by moving forward. Wow. So for so me, what I I'm hearing you say is change is constant. Yes. It's the one thing that is true in life. And the real question is to ask, what is the positivity of this change? What yeah. can I gain from this change? Because the one thing in life is change is constant. Actually, we said it earlier. We said either you're growing or you're dying. Yeah. And if everything stays the same way as it always been, it just means there's no progress. Uh, Pastor Kellos, you're going to add something to that. Yeah, and I think the, um, the first part I want to start is by saying, if that's you, your life group was working for you, uh, and the reality is that uh, this team made, we, we are the ones who propagated join a life group. <laughs> so I, I want to st step in first of all and say sorry, that you know that there is pain, that you are hurt. Uh, it's, not, it's not, the design was not to create what you break, what you hurt. Am I making sense? There was no design progression of how this is the perfect way to hurt Mavunites after 10 years. That's, that wasn't the design. So th there was that. But as, as, as fathers of the house, we have to be faithful to the call of God over the church. And the reality is that the vehicle that we had designed, and, and I truly believe it was the vehicle for that season and for that moment, and it worked. But for, for us to be faithful with the call of God over the church, even as God continues to open up revelation, no revelation builds on top, eh? uh, as God continues to open up what he's calling us into, we have to desire to be faithful in every season and say, God, we will hurt people again. Genuinely, even me right now, I love discipleship groups. Now, if next week or next year, God says, now you are forming ecclesia groups, <laughs> I'll be like, God. But I'll still be saying we'll need to be faithful. We'll figure out a communication strategy. We'll figure out a transition strategy. But it's never designed to hurt as much as it is designed to, to be faithful to God's call over this church. And that we belong to a church that when God changes direction, I mean, children of Israel, there are places that would go, they stay for one year. Another place they go, they stay for two days. Another place they go, they, they, it's the afternoon. We need to be able to say the cloud is moving and we are moving. But it's not so that you don't park or unpack. It's so that you can be faithful to where God is leading us as a church. Oh, and I think oh, you want oh. to belong to a church like that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 I, that, yeah. Uh, I wanted to add something. Sure. Um, I think Pastor Kev has just triggered something in my mind uh, when he was talking about the children of Israel and just the space that they were in. Uh, these guys had a promise. There was a land of promise. But in the place of the in-between was a wilderness, isn't it? Uh, the challenge is if we consider the place of promise um, uh, as we are journeying, that wherever we are is the destination, then we get it all wrong. Uh, a lot of times when we lose sight of the ultimate, the promise, the vision, the big picture of where we are going, we become uh, prisoners of our current circumstances or places. And it happens in every area, whether it's relationships or whether you are making money or in your presence of family or where you are living. Every time you lose sight of the big picture, you will find yourself a victim of your current circumstances and a prisoner of it. And with the children of Israel, we may end up doing the things that they did. Number one, just keeping looking back, looking at leeks and garlic and whatever we had. And uh, the challenge with that when you live in history and you are living in comparison, then even it's easy to lose your place of purpose, your place of destiny. The other thing these guys did, they started murmuring and grumbling. You see, when you do comparisons, because one will fall short of what was familiar, 
it's so easy to start murmuring. It's so easy to start grumbling. And, and the interesting thing with every reason that the children of Israel murmured for was a fact. If it is water, they didn't have water. If it is a shelter, uh, they were living outside. If it is tombs, uh, it's funny, they were complaining about tombs in Egypt and nobody was dying here now uh, by the time they were complaining. Uh, so it's so interesting that murmuring and grumbling came, back, came up. And the challenge with murmuring and grumbling, it will make you become like them, become rebellious. Because you see, gripe, gripe, you can rationalize gripe any time of the day. You can rationalize how you feel any time of the day. And with these guys, as they started murmuring and grumbling, then they became rebellious. Now, the thing that is so interesting is in this rebellion, they created their own image of God. Now, the challenge we have is when we put ourselves in a place of murmuring and grumbling, then we'll create the wrong image of where even Mavuno is going. Because you'll start creating the image of Mavuno in your image and likeness, in how you want it to look like. And then you will not follow. And it gets worse. With these children of Israel, when they started working with the mixed multitude, getting people who looked like them, who had packed blood uh, on the doors, and that is why they came out of Egypt, all of them, uh, you, you get a grouping of people, start getting groups, start having uh, rumor clinics, uh, start having gossip. Uh, 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 and you know, gossip, Moshene is, is tamu, you know, it's sweet. Uh, uh, so when you start getting those cliques and groupings, then you find uh, those are the people who even led Israel to do the wrong thing. Yeah. They are the ones who led them into the Moabite women. They are the ones who led them into saying, let's go to Ai. Uh, it's, it's those proselytes. So you also need to take care. Who are you walking with? Who are you listening to uh, during this process? And if they are not going and they are murmuring and they are grumbling and they are rebellious, then just avoid the children of Korah. I think for me, on the going forward, that's what I would throw uh, inside there. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Milton. I'm going to move us to the next question. But I mean, as you speak, one of the things that I think about is just how, even as a parent, I've sought to be faithful in bringing up my children. And I remember at one season of our lives teaching them, come home early. You stay in the house. You make yourself busy in the house. Now we're in a new season where we're saying, go to your own house. Start being independent. Don't come home until the weekend. <laughs> and it's painful. It's painful. But you know, it is the season. And I'm just going back to what Pastor Kilonzi said, that the LGs were for a season. And we're in a new season. I don't feel we're in a different vision, but I just feel like as we seek as parents to be faithful to the task God has given us to as parents, that we are going to, we're going to be trying to interpret what God is saying for the family at that time. And I can tell you, we never ever anticipated that they would be telling our kids, what are you doing home in the weekday? Connie College has closed. Because we're trying to teach them now a new skill, which we didn't even know we'd need to teach them at that time. Does that make sense? So change is consistent. There's seasons. And I think what we need to, to, to ask is, are we as pastors being faithful to the leading of the Spirit? Uh, and I, I, can't be, I can't be honest and tell you, we'll never have, like Pastor Kelonzi said, another change in Mavuno. Because I'm not God. But I'm hoping that we can remain humble and listening to the Holy Spirit. And that you would also, as sons and daughters of this house, say, this is a season, so now it's time for us. Maybe a time will come and we are like, don't come for gathering, go and do your own gathering. Okay, let me not even joke about that. Uh, I had, <laughs> number two, I had a very painful and complicated relationship with my father. Even though he's alive, it's still very difficult. I've had this conversation about spiritual fathers and mothers at Mavuno, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. Are you guys trying to replace my father? Should I not just refer to the leaders as my pastors and spiritual authority and not spiritual parents? Help. So that's a, Anybody want to take that one? Um, I think I can add, give it a shot. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so I, maybe I can answer the simplest part first. Are you trying to replace my father? And the answer is no. And I think we've said that, and Pastor M, you've taught that over and over. Even at this gathering, you talked about, when you talked about the giving, how the Pharisees would say, you can, you know, refuse to give to your parents because, uh, you know, and say you're giving to God. 
And you've thought about that consistently. And so the, the sim that one has a simple answer. The answer is no. Uh, so why are we getting into this conversation of, of spiritual parenting? And, I'll, and, and I want to say I grew up in a mainstream church. I've been a believer since when I was much younger. Uh, from that mainstream church when I joined at uh, the university, I became a part of the Nairobi Chapel family. I was in the University of Nairobi and I joined Mamlaka Hill Chapel and then came to Mavuno. In all my years of church, at no point was this parenting idea a part of my church culture. And so as I say this, I'm saying this as someone who has, has gotten into this culture here as, as many of you have and as many of us have. Some of you are from places where you are in that culture. It makes you nervous because some things went wrong. Uh, but and many of us have never been there and it's this huge change and it doesn't make sense. Uh, so I want to say the first thing that I'll say, and it's kind of uh, implied in the question, in, in my perspective, what I found is that where we are coming from has spoken very loudly into how we have heard and received this information. So for example, um, you know, I didn't grow up uh, you know, with a father who says to me, I love you. Uh, I didn't grow up with a, you know, I don't have a very you know, tight relationship emotionally. We are strong, strong, as we said yesterday. Uh, my dad lives outside, uh, out, my parents live outside of Kenya. I have made a point, especially close by, no. God caused you to buy the home yeah. that was close to the church where the things he has in store for you are imparted so that you can receive them. Yeah. How you receive them is by inheritance. Yeah. Inheritance is for sons. So there's no so other good. way for you so to good. inherit. Wow. I have a best friend, you know, I love Papa Kilo here. If I go and introduce him to my mom and dad and they love him, you know, maybe we went to college together, have friends like those, they, 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 we did speed sleepovers at my house and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so my parents know them and they love them. When my parents will have a conversation about inheritance of property, they are not going to say, oh, by the way, that friend of yours, who uh, hurts, he, who what's, what's his dad? ID number? Yeah. The one who so that me. they can appoint, do you understand? Inheritance is for sons. Yeah. And, and I see that in the scriptures. I see David moving into the, uh, you know, into the palace so he can inherit kingship because he's coming from being a, a shepherd. I see uh, Paul speaking to Titus and Timothy, referring to them as sons, referring to a church as his children. Uh, so I can see that in the scriptures, this is a model that is portrayed for us. Maybe the last thing I would say past time is I'm very passionate about parenting. My wife and I are very passionate about parenting. About two years ago, I don't even know if I've ever told you this, uh, we did the Proverbs challenge. You had us do the Proverbs challenge for two months. The first month you told us, guys, I want you to focus on leadership. Let's share our takeouts as we, you know, read with a focus on leadership. And we read and we shared our takeouts. The second month you said, let's focus on spiritual parenting. And that month blew my mind because I realized there are things I have been condoning in the lives of people that I am a spiritual leader over that I will never condone in the lives of my three children. Yeah. There, my level of responsibility increased when I understood that I am a parent. Wow. So that where I have sat with husbands who are cheating on their wives, and I have said to them, you know, what, so what are you looking for? Are you trying to have your cake and eat it? You know, those, those are the conversations we have. And the posture of my heart was, I know where this will end. This path has been walked many times. I know where it leads. So I said, and the posture of my heart sad to say was, okay, you go when things break down, because I know they will. I'll be here. I'm your pastor. I shall be here to receive you. And it's like we're both adults, you, make, you, you do, you live your life. As a father, you can't. it would be completely horrible for me to respond to my firstborn or my secondborn, my two boys, in that way. Yeah. And so now there is, a, there is a perspective that I have obtained. I am afraid of thinking of Pastor M as my spiritual father because of what it could mean for me. What if he abuses me? And what I don't think is that if Pastor M becomes a father over me, what is his level of responsibility to me? Wow. I have a love now for the people that I lead here because I see them as sons and daughters that God has given me the privilege to raise. Wow. I do not have that responsibility. If I'm just your pastor, 
my only responsibility is to, is to teach you the word. Thus saith the Lord, this is what it means. Go and live your life. Wow. 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 <laughs> I'm drowning in the depth of this team. <laughs> Pastor Kara, you want to add something? Yeah. But that was a powerful word, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. Absolutely Inheritance powerful. for sons. And um, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll just reference a, a scripture that caught my attention. And this was the story of Cornelius. You know, him praying, and um, I, I think Peter is the one who was sent to him. And, uh, uh, you know, the story goes on. But then, when it came to salvation, it was salvation for him and his family. And when I came across that, I was like, what do you mean family? Isn't salvation uh, a personal decision? I mean, my family members, it's, uh, you know, where if they come to the Lord, that's fine. But salvation is personal. And, and, and I came to see that there's a way that the scriptures see um, uh, uh, believers and there's a way that our Western influence sees. So I think the Western theology really sees um, people as individuals. Your salvation is yours, it's personal, and you have a personal relationship with God. I don't believe that that's the way um, you, that, that scripture sees it. Even the whole thing of you've been adopted into the body of Christ, we take it all the body, but you see the body is this one. We are the yeah. body of Christ, we are the local expression of the body of Christ. And when you use the word adoption, it's, it's a family. It's really in the context of a family. And so what I personally have just begun to understand is that God is, is in the business of creating families, just families, spiritual families. Yeah. And when we understand ourselves as part of a family, then our perspective changes. I think as Pastor James says, for us who are parents, you're like, wow, 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 hey, my responsibility has just gone up. My prayer responsibility has gone up. My, I'm like, I, I, surely the way I'm raising my three kids there's no way I would be proud if, um, say, uh, their kids were not doing well. I'd be, I have failed <laughs> as a parent. <laughs> I have failed as a parent to ensure. So it raises the level of, of, of accountability. But then I also feel that it gives a very strong sense of identity. Mm. It really does. I'm part of this family. I'm part of something bigger. And it's my spiritual family. And there are benefits, as Pastor James says, of inheritance. Then the language of inheritance comes in. Uh, so I, I feel it is the, the lens through which we interpret scripture. It has been very Western. And, and um, I feel that that lens of individual creates orphans. Uh, people have no sense of identity. You're lost. You're like... Um, uh, I, you know, I'm just a loose cannon somewhere in, in, in the world. And, um, and it leads to a lot of brokenness. Yeah. Yeah, when you're just an individual. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That was really good. I mean, I know that all of you have had a journey. I mean, that you've gone through a journey on this one. Because this, this, I think this is really at the essence, at the heart of this conversation. And I know I've had different conversations with you as you struggled to come to your own conclusion about why, why am I a son? Why am I a daughter? And what does that mean? And so um, let me ask this one. What if you abuse your authority over me? So someone says, we've been talking about following hard, all this fatherhood, sonship. But what if somebody is above me and then they abuse that authority? Uh, would, or are we op I guess this is what they're asking. Is, are, are we then opening ourselves then to this being abused? Pastor Godwin, you want to say something about that? All right. I think that's a very legit concern, uh, given that, of course, uh, you're in a space where you want to be fathered. You're, at least, if you've come to that conclusion that this is my father, you're in a space where you expect to be shepherded, to be fathered, <clears throat> but betrayal can happen. In fact, I remember there's a time Pastor M taught us and said, every family has issues. And just consider your family right now. There are some significant issues that your family carries. I remember when we went for, to the prayer mountain, one of the pastors said we need to, we were praying about uh, foundations. And this pastor said, some families here have the generational pattern of loving Ugali too much. <laughs> and, you know, every family has issues. And so when you come to a spiritual family as well, we have issues. 
Pastor Emma has mentioned several times that your pastors also have issues. I think you've seen it even in this gathering, how we've all been vulnerable and we've been saying, Pastor M, and you know, God is helping us through Pastor M to see some of these issues that we've been carrying. And so there's a place to also extend grace and say, my disciple, my shepherd, my DG leader, my MC leader, zonal pastor, campus pastor, has the potential to hurt me. Um, so there's a place to extend grace in that sense. However, the second level that I would want to answer that question would be, there's a place now where the, there's, an, so there's an intended uh, offense or hurt that may be caused, but there's also some deliberate abuse of authority that may come uh, as you're being shepherded. Now, there's another, another way that Pastor M also taught us, uh, and I, I think it was in one of the gatherings. And Pastor M taught us that every time your disciple abuses authority, um, you defer to the higher authority. Amen? And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow me as I, uh, come on disciples of the Lord God, follow me as I follow Christ. So the, the condition to following someone is if they are following Christ. Yeah. When they stop following Christ, that's when you stop following. And past time, this, even this, um, this, this gathering taught us and said, if someone offends you, and I, I can also say that for abuse of authority, if someone abuses authority, number one step is go to them and say, hey, and yeah, Pastor Godwin, you are teaching us something that is not consistent with scripture. Like the Bereans would go and refer to scripture just to see, is this Paul chochaing us or AKA, is he inciting us? Is he telling us things that are not consistent with scripture? So go back to your scripture and say, what Pastor Godwin is teaching is not consistent with scripture, it's not consistent with where we are going as a movement. So approach Pastor Godwin and say, Pastor Godwin, I don't think this is right. I think you're misleading us in a very kind way. Uh, <laughs> But then, if they refuse, what's the precedence? You go with a witness. If they still refuse, the next precedence is you go with the church. And in that case, now you defer to the higher authority. You say, let me rope in another exec uh, pastor here. Let me, let me rope in Pastor M and just mention this thing that has been happening in my campus. If it's your DG leader, let me rope in my MC leader. And Pastor M has given us that structure today that you can go to your MC leader and say, hey, my DG leader, I've tried A, B, C, D, I've gone with a witness, but they are still not doing that, they are still abusing authority, could you come and intervene? If, again, they don't listen to the church in that sense, when you've gotten to that level, then the Bible says you treat them as a pagan, which means you just let them, like you just, you know, go to uh, pray for them. Eh? But, but so there is an intended offense that one can be caused, but if the offense or the abuse of authority is deliberate, defer to the higher authority. Uh, you know, this movement, God has given us this movement as a gift, and our leaders as a gift to shepherd us in the direction God wants us to go. There is no single person in this movement that is out to say, as Pastor Kilonzi said, in 10 years, we want to just frustrate this movement until they, they, they suffer the consequences of following us. There is no one who is set out to frustrate anyone in this movement. So keep, you re, just remember that you are following the God of this movement and the leadership of this movement. And so there is a higher authority that is higher than Pastor Godin. There is a higher authority. Pastor M even gave us the liberty and said, if I abuse authority in Mavuno Church, go to Bishop Oscar. Can you imagine? We have a lineage of leaders that are godly, that are following Christ. But the moment they stop following Christ, defer to the higher authority. I love that. Maybe, thank um, you. I have a story that I think, well, maybe just as you, before yeah. you get the story, I was going to say, I feel like it's kind to talk to the person before you go to the authority. Because when you go to the authority first, you really, you can hurt their relationship, because that's gossip. And that's why Jesus gives us this precedent. Talk to the person. Uh, if you're really scared, send them a text or what's up, and identify yourself, and just say, I'm really uncomfortable about what you taught us on Sunday at the gathering. This is what I see. And you're giving them the opportunity then to respond. And you might find when they respond, you're like, okay, now I get it. Or ask another question. Or if you feel like they're just hard-hearted, then that's when you now activate the system of going to somebody else. So, so thank you. I have had people who went to Pastor Oscar without talking to me. And I, I was hurt because, not even to Pastor Oscar, to even other pastors in the city. And they just went to say, Pastor M is starting a cult. We don't agree. And I thought, why didn't you sit with me and tell me? I would have been happy to en entertain an audience. 
So I feel like this thing, it actually creates heart. Yeah. You are heart, so you heart another person. Mm. As opposed to using Matthew 18 that allows us to actually bring healing mm. when there's feel, a feeling of I've been offended or I've been wounded by something the pastor said. So yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I sat in a DG with some sons and daughters here at Hill City. And, you know, we just ha had some very strong conversations on following hard. We were talking about things like being command commandable. And they were just like, oh, my gosh, uh, where is this going? Uh, why is this so hard? And uh, so I just want to illustrate something. Because in that conversation, for each of them, I, had an, I was able to say to them, what have I asked you to do that you haven't done? And the thing that I was illustrating to them is, you're already commandable. I said to them, the way Pastor M is teaching us to follow, is that not how you already follow me? And the thing I realized is that the, the, they had already sort of gotten there uh, somehow as in their growth, in their faith. It, it had already produced a certain following of me as a spiritual leader, uh, as a pastor over them and a spiritual leader over them. But now the teaching sort of made it a formal expectation. And I think now there was a panic. But I was able to say, I asked you to do this. It, it even cost you money. Did I even ask you how much it cost? No. So, uh, and do you feel like I've abused my authority over you? They're like, no. I mean, uh, I said to them, if I ask you to do it again, will you do it? Yes. So the, the, the heart is already there. But I think at some point now when, when, when the teaching came, it's like there was a bit of a panic, what if it's abused and so on. And for me, I feel like it illustrates the same thing I said about spiritual parenting. The, the anxiety there, it's based on practical things that yes, this authority could be abused, but it also is rooted in part with where I have come from. Yeah, that there is a way I came into the conversation. If I have been hurt before, if I've been wounded before, uh, or if I've seen some people wounded before who are close to me and that I care about, uh, the, the struggle is a little deeper. Wow. Yeah, the struggle is a little deeper. Let me ask something then, if we're talking about this. Huh? Somebody says, what's the hurry? Even if I'm getting it, why can't we just do this change in a slower pace? Why are we in such a hurry to implement uh, this shift? I don't know if somebody uh, wants to talk about... Probably they can, okay, they can say something about it. <clears throat> I remember the story in uh, John chapter 9, 4 and 5. And for me, the answer is that people are dying. People are hurting. People are broken. People are wounded. People are confused. People are all this thing. And at that time, the disciples of Jesus were so concerned as to why Jesus decided to heal the blind guy. And at some point they asked him, who sinned? Is it him? Is it his parents? Is it his forefathers? And Jesus was like, guys, I must work the work of the father when it is still day. Because a time will come, night will come, when I won't be able to do these things. So if we get to a place where we understand that we are not, we are not moving fast, but there's a lot of need of people who are going through a lot of tough times out there, we won't be able to see it. Because this is it. This is the time when we need to do this. But then again, I sit down and ask myself, I'm like, I don't think this is happening too fast. Because it's taken the church five years for us to get here. It started, this journey started off five years ago with the executive pastors. At the time, I wasn't a part of it. The executive pastors took two years. It came to the pa campus pastors for a year. It's gotten to the congregation for another two years. So five years, I don't believe it is too fast. Because I have seen other, other, other things that we have had to do, which when you, we were asked to do this, even before you process it, you see you've taken another corner. But really this has taken five years. And what excites me about it is that through the journey of the five years, Pastor M, you've always come back doing all the gatherings that we've had, and you have taught us the why, of which you taught us, you started off with the executive team five years ago. You've always opened up uh, uh, questions in terms of, okay, this is, uh, we, we, we spoke about it, uh, you're processing this, I'm still willing and ready to continue answering the questions, including this one, this, this session that we're having right now, of something that we started five years ago. So as a, as, 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 as a person, I'm not really seeing it that it's taken 
too much time because it, it, it has been a five-year journey. The other thing that I get, uh, I get to look at it is at what point, this is a question that I ask myself, at what point did I get into it? Because if I got into it three years ago, I'd say that it's taken three years. If I got into, uh, into it two years ago or one year ago, I'd say it has taken, it's, it's too much speed and it's happening fast because I caught it at this particular, particular moment in time. But if you were able to start with it at the beginning, start with the process, see the process, walk the process, ask the questions, pray about it, Five years, Kibaki alishato, Uru alishato ka sayi tuko kwa ruto. A government has already changed hands. Five years. A government has already changed hands. So, it is, it is, it is the where at which you may be onboarded and, and, and get to look at it at either fast, slow. But for me, I have seen things that you have done in Mavuno that took less than six months. This is where we are. It has started. We are getting into it. Then something else comes up. Uh, there is this one. You get to shift even before you you're, you're finishing the other one. So f five years for me, it it, it is not. Wow. That is just me anyway. So that's Can interesting. I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry for. So for me, I don't see it as a, as a a question of time. I see it as a question of obedience. Because God can tell you something and then you decide to take your time. And that time you give the devil opportunity of suggesting something else. Even in the Bible, you see when God, always when God would give an instruction, like Abraham, he was told, go sacrifice your son. It says he woke up early the next morning and he set out on the journey. Mm. So you can decide to take time and say, oh, I need to go tell all the village that you know you'll no longer see Isaac, so go say your goodbyes. And then Sarah will get ideas and say, oh, Abraham, have we really thought about this? You know, uh, <laughs> as a spouse. Anyway, and, and before you know it, you're not sacrificing Isaac. So I believe it's a question of when God speaks, will you take time to obey or you're like, Early the next morning, the moment I receive the instruction, I'm doing it. Come Everything on. will align as I go along. Wow, wow, so Pastor good. Pastor M. It's such a good, oh, Pastor Noah, you're going to yes. add something, yeah. Let me just use an analogy that um, I, I was telling Pastor Godwin this morning. When we were coming, we unfortunately missed our alarm, so we came on the expressway so fast. What an express indeed. And so what happened is, um, we were in the car, we were moving really, really fast. I looked at the speedometer, I was like, hey, guys. My friend. We're... Pastor Godwin, we are looking at you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's so when I, when I looked at the speedometer, it looked, it looked like it was really, really fast. But when I looked at the road, like we were moving at an okay speed. And standing from outside, if you looked at the car, you would see it <laughs> moving past really fast, right? And so how I see it is, just hopping on to what you've said about obedience. Obedience would be you mo taking that step and, and, and getting into the car so that you're not seeing it moving so fast. But if you're seated on the outside, you Ish. will see it whizzing so fast. Wow. That is so amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you I for think the wisdom, I can add ladies. on to that as yeah. well. Yeah. I think for me, just to, to flip it a bit, when I look at the places where we work, your boss will come in the morning and decide, today we are going to change this thing to this other thing, Ish. and we will not question the boss, we will do what he has said. This is because we are being paid by this boss to do that. How much more an instruction that has come from God, and we are busy saying we cannot do it. So where, where is our obedience? Is it to God? Or, is it, or are we going to listen to our prophet because he's listening to God? Or are we going to say, now we'll ask questions, let's go and do what our bosses want. Wow. So for me, it's, 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 it's a comparison of the two. In the offices, we obey, we do. In a span of a second, we've done it. Even if your boss comes and tells you, today you will sweep the floor, you will mop, you will do it without questions. Yeah. So how much of an instruction that comes from God? I like it. You know, it's interesting, and 
What a pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's, so, it's such a good... I love the answers that you've all given. Um, yeah, I really do. I, almost, I cannot, answer, I cannot add, add to any of those. But I, I really have tried. Somebody just asked the question, why are we having this Q&A session now, three years later? <laughs> and again, if you're outside the vehicle, that's the first time you've ever heard me talk about these issues. But in every gathering, and this is number what? This is gathering number 12, 13. We try and address the issues. We never used to have a, a place where you could all come and I just address what God is saying to us all at once. So you're not even hearing it through somebody else translating it. And if you haven't been there, you're hearing it in your campus for the first time. Of course, it feels like this is the only time you've ever had issues being asked. And one of the things that we've done, and also, let me also add, all these pastors are human. So everybody has also taken time to understand the issue. And sometimes one of the things that they're learning is the speed of the leader is also the speed of the movement. If Pastor Godwin is struggling, and I'm not saying he's struggling, by the way, he did not struggle. I, I, <laughs> but if he's struggling with the change, it'll take a while before the people in life way understand the change. It's just the reality. And for me, I was not forcing any of my leaders to understand it. I was like, let's walk the journey. Keep asking the questions. And that's why I say at very different points in their journey, I could tell the light has come on for this one. And I'd say, praise God. So I think it's just to say, if you're hearing it for the first time, it's not because it's the first time it's been addressed. And my hope is it's not the last time. Neither will it be the only time. That every time we have an opportunity, ask the questions. And my hope is if we don't have the answer, we'll say we don't know. But at this point, I guess the thing is we're trying to be as faithful to the Lord as possible. One of the things I tell people is uh, the thing that really convicts me about the culture change is I reached a place where I could no longer accept to be responsible for a congregation of church members. Because Jesus never asked me to make church members of the nations. And I just reached a place where, honestly, my own conscience could not allow me. I'm that kind of person. I can't do it. And I remember just having conversations with these guys and saying, God has called us to make disciples. You have to become my disciples. Because if you're not, then I'm wasting my time. And that was a shift, uh, an urgent shift, because I reached a place where I was like, let's deal with this because we have to do it. So some of you have new campuses that have just come into the conversation. Some of you, your campuses are aligning better every day because your pastor now is aligning. You know what I mean? And I don't hold anybody in condemnation. I know Pastor, pastor Milton aligned at a different place from Pastor James, aligned at a different place from Pastor Kilo. But I also know that these are the people God has called me to lead with. And I'm committed to them as we make this shift together. So I think it's just important. I love the answers there. There's a good question being asked. Does this shift mean I, mean I must do what is being asked? What is being asked? What is a free, why is the freedom to me being taken away from me? Can't I, for example, just pray alone and be heard by God? So wow. I don't know if somebody wants to just speak. Yeah. Pastor Carl? Yes. Um, I think I'm going to share a story to illustrate this because, um, as we said, we are also learning um, along. Um, I'd mentioned earlier that there's a difference between individual Christianity and, the, and, and when we are called to a family. And I remember this church member coming to us um, uh, with an issue, and, and she was like, my goodness, this is what God has told me. Because, and uh, she was going through a, a few things, but I must tell you that this person is a prayer warrior, a proper prayer warrior, a person who who says, um, uh, who'll tell you, oh, you know, God told me this, I had this. You know, it's like they, it's like they, are, they are buddies huh, with God. But she told me, God has instructed me to come uh, and, and request for prayers from Mavuno because the altar at Mavuno is stronger than the altar in my house. So there's something there about... Uh, when we come together and pray together. So from that, I learned that this, when, uh, in fact, you, you may have heard me in my prayers saying, we are joining our prayers, we are joining our, our, 
fasting, the, our, our fast and the sacrifice of our fast. And in fact, I was praying now for a family member. And I said, Lord, I'm not coming here by myself. I come, first of all, under the covering of Mavuno Church and the altar of Mavuno Church and the collective prayer of the Mavuno movement. So we've been praying and fasting. So I've not come alone. Me, I'm not alone. I have come, and there's that whole backing of that sacrifice that everyone has put in. You know, in the, in the war, there's no, uh, you're not a single soldier. You will not make it. It is the corporate uh, fighting or the corporate coming together wow. of the whole army so that gives us the, the success. So this whole thing of individual Christian and understanding I'm part of a family, I'm part of an army, and that when I even claim that, and I understand the altar here is greater than the, great, than the altar in my house, <laughs> then I think my, my understanding just changed uh, to the fact that there is power when we pray together. In fact, try claiming that for yourself. You know, as you're doing your 21-day fast, yeah. just say, I'm praying this for my family, but I'm not alone. I have, I'm coming under that altar and under that power of that altar to present my requests. And I think that's the way we need to understand the body of Christ, that we are a family. We are not just individuals. Wow, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back. I'm going to let Pastor James say something about that. But also just on that note, I've said before, that one of the things we've been taught that is faulty in our theology is we've individualized the gospel. Yeah. And we've individualized the promises of scripture. Yeah. Majority of the promises of scripture were not given to individuals, they were given to the people of Christ. Yeah. And we activate those promises when we activate them together. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We always claim that as for me. Yeah. And we don't understand. That was a promise given to the people. And when we collectively claim the promise, God acts. Because we are collecting, we're doing it as God's people. We are not created as individual Christians. We are created as the body of Christ. And so I think it's very important to understand the fault in our theology, the individualization of the gospel that Pastor Carol talked about. But Pastor James, you're going to say something as well. Yeah, I was actually asking you to share a story you once told us. So Pastor once told us a story about, I don't know if it was a monk who was extremely, extremely prayerful. Yes. And there was a community not far from where he was praying. And one day, you know, he, he was, was a desert father. He was a desert father. So he, had, he had withdrawn from the world so he doesn't get contaminated. Yeah. yeah. And then as he was praying, the Holy Spirit opened his eyes to see uh, the, 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 what was happening in the spirit. And for sure, there was activity in the spirit. And as he was praying, there were like arrows shooting up into the air. And so there was definitely spiritual activity. But the Holy Spirit opened his eyes to see a, a church of people who were praying, who were nowhere near being as prayerful as he was, but they were praying together. And where he was seeing sort of arrows going up into the heavens, when he looked at that, uh, at that church, what the Holy Spirit helped him see was that there was like a whole a column of fire going up into the heavens. And so specifically about prayer, the results are different when I'm praying alone. And listen, I pray. But the results are different when I am praying alone from when I am praying in community. I told you guys I learned to ask myself, what is the biblical pattern? What do the scriptures say? There is no time in the scriptures when a community fasted for more than three days before breakthrough came. Oof. Wow. All right. I, that's a great answer. I like this question, and I think there are two of them that I'll connect together. Um, why do we have to brand those who disagree with the shift as people with an orphan spirit or rebellious? Um, <laughs> and then somebody else also said, if I'm not persuaded, should I leave Mavuno? So, yeah. Um, anyone want to try that one? Okay, Pastor Godwin wants to say something about that. Yeah, why, why are you branding people? <laughs> I, I think, well, maybe let me, start, let me answer the first one. I think last year when we went through the network gatherings, you really helped us. And let me say, guys, can we just celebrate Pastor Emma and Pastor Carol? <laughs> so, so when, and Pastor Emma said, when we've been given responsibility over God's people, 
you actually need the language to use uh, to address some of the issues that you encounter on a daily basis as you disciple. And so he gave us the language in uh, the September to November gathering. And he talked about the stages. If you guys remember, for those who are here, he talked about the stages of disloyalty. And, and you know, there were eight stages yeah. from, from independence all the way to ex execution or judgment. And in every one of those stages, there's a place where you can identify. There's a place where I said, eh, hey, yeah, there's a, I'm not in an independent spirit, but at some point, if I'm always saying, how can I contextualize this for life way, then like, independence, there's a kind of independence there. And so it's, it's so, it's not to brandish someone as you are being rebellious, it's to say, where am I in this spectrum? And I would refer you to go back to that because I can't cover all that in one sharing. But where am I in this spectrum? At what point am I carrying myself out as someone who has the potential of being rebellious? So it's not to say we are out to say, hey, let me see, let me see. One, two, three, rebellious. Three, four, five, ah, that one is uh, a, a defy. Uh, uh? Passive. A passive. Uh, or this one is um, uh, an independent spirit. No, it's not to say we are branding. It's just to say, as I am shepherding my flock, the Bible says that give careful attention to your flock. All of us are shepherds, and we've been commissioned, and we are going to be commissioned, rather, to be shepherds. All of us. Pastor Emma's prophesied idea and said, every one of us is going to lead a DG, bare minimum. We are going to lead the smallest unit of influence, kingdom influence, which is a DG, but just like an, a, an ordinary shepherd, you need to sit down and say, what's the state of my flock? What's the state of my sheep? There's, there's one here that needs to be, she, is it called sheared? The removing of the fur? Yeah. Sheared. There's another one here that needs to be dewormed. There's another one here that needs to be dehooved. Uh, if there's something like that, <laughs> it behooves you. And so you need, to, you need to analyze the state of your flock so that you know how to help your sheep. So it's not to say we are out to brandish people as rebellious, but it's to say, where are my people struggling and how can I help them as a shepherd? How can I help these people to be more like Jesus? Because that's what discipleship is about. Because guess what? In Hebrews, we are told that we, you need, we need to submit to authority because this same authority, these same leaders God has given us will one day give an account. Ladies and gentlemen, we will give an account for everyone in this movement and say, God, you gave me my 10. You remember the 10 minas? The one mina uh, that became 10. We will give an account and say, Father, you gave me this and I've multiplied to this much. And so it's not to brandish, but to say, what's the state of my flock? What's the state of my sheep? And how can I help them to be more like Jesus? I think that's what I would answer the first part at least. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Come on. Wow. Yeah. yeah I and think, I think this, oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. And I think the second part of that question is if I don't agree, can, you know, should I leave? I don't think that's the, the heart. You know, it's not like, you know, like uh, you're. As I think, you know, as, as pastors, I become a father. I, like, I can't tell you, but the way I love, not just downtown, but the network is just different. Uh, before, you know, Pastor Mugambi was one of my reports. Now he's my son. There are things I have to fight for him because he's my son. So it's not for. Oh, you don't get it bound because you, you, you leaving me as your pastor, for me, I've already accepted you as my son. So it's, it's, there's, that, there's that part for, to, to, to understand where, the, where the, the conversation is springing from. Uh, what I would say is that before you exit, there are a couple of things you need to be able to tell yourself. Number one, engage with the process. Come for, for 30 prayers and realize you're actually praying to Jesus and the, the, what you're praying for is actually listed there. Come for gatherings, listen to the content, refer with scriptures, see, engage with the process in that sense. But we also come and realize, and yeah, I've engaged the process, I've, I've come for everything, the frequency is not just frequenting. You know, it's, we are, I'm not there. And sometimes just because you've engaged, you've, you've received something good, but yeah, there's just the, 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 how you vibe is not how the church is, the, the current community is. Then what I'll say is, then go to the church that has that frequency in your heart. Go there. Go look for the pastor. Go realize what they do. Engage and be all in. Be a disciple there. Because the worst thing is now to live here to go and be a backbencher somewhere else. It doesn't help you in the context of your entire Christian faith. I believe God has given the body of Christ uh, uh, everything that is needed for every believer to belong somewhere. And not just to belong, but to be a part and parcel for it. 
Now, if you choose to live as a father, genuinely, I'll be the first person to be like, what? Because I know we are offering a good meal. And I know what God is doing in this church is good for everyone to belong to and to be able to grow. But, but, but I'm also, as, 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 you know, as, a, as a father, I have, to, I have to then sit at the gate and say, I wish you come back home. And the day you come, a cloak is on you. You're part of the house. Let's go. Let's get on, you know, with the family business. I want, you, I want to be able to, and I have prayed and said, God, anyone who left, maybe because the language wasn't accessible or something, bring them home. I have prayed for that in as much as I also want to say, if you're in and then you've, you've tried, the last three, it's been hard, then maybe there's a space for you to say, okay, let me see something else. But as your pastor, I'll be the first one to be like, what? I don't think so. I want to fight for you. And even in this team, we fought for each other. We, uh, <laughs> Pastor Godwin, uh, Wendy Mali, Niko Nawewe, Nanyu Wendy. Oh, you are not going anywhere, Pastor Godwin, <laughs> and you have not gone because even your wife is like you're driving too fast. <laughs> Pro probably they can add something to what... Uh... I, I think uh, yesterday, uh, in yesterday's uh, talks, uh, I think we were being taught about being a good shepherd. And, um, you know, what to do, uh, and uh, Pastor Marie presented the uh, different parables, the parable of the lost coin, uh, the parable of the lost sheep. He presented all these parables, and oh my goodness, the parable and the story of the prodigal son. And I was like, oh gosh, these standards are so high, because when you're told that you're, when you talk about, you know, what kind of shepherd should you be, you know, the father waited for the lost son, yes. the prodigal son to come home. Eh, do you know it's not easy? And, and, he, and he taught, you know, uh, the, the father had to sell the property and, and the boy just took the property and went and squandered it. So even from a parental perspective, there's pain. I mean, this person has pained you, have, has hurt you. Yet I think what Jesus there is saying is that, hey, uh, you wait there like the father. You wait for the prodigal son. I'm like, oh my God, this is really hard. But I think these are the things that we are being taught of. What kind of shepherds should we be? And I don't think that speaks of uh, uh, that uh, if you don't agree, just bounce. Or if you don't agree, um, I think the posture of this house, the posture of the things that we were even being taught yesterday is that no, we, we wait, we search, we look. We pray. And I think those are the responsibilities of a spiritual parent. You, 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 your child can't just say they're bouncing and you say, it's been real. No, <laughs> you, it's never real. You, you know, and I think maybe when, when God says that you're in a spiritual family, he knew that the responsibility on the parents would really be a difficult one of, 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 of travailing. That's what we do for our children. You pray, you fast, you travail. Uh, you look messy, you know, as you're crying. <laughs> but, and that's the exact same thing that God expects that we do for our uh, spiritual family. Wow. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to move to the next question, but I love that answer because it really is a parenting. Yeah, let's appreciate Pastor Carol. That really is a parenting. I think as a parent, you'd understand. If a child says, I'm leaving, if they're an adult, you can't stop them, but you cry. I mean, parents, parents weep. Sometimes, with, and the kids think they don't, but they do. It's painful to lose someone. And so as parents, I mean, and it's interesting because I tell all my church planters, you will remember your first one. So recently, one of my church planters wrote me and said, past time it happened, I got divorced by a church member. <laughs> they told me it's been real. I no longer feel the Lord wants me in your church. Uh, thanks for all, thanks for everything. On text, though I booted on text. I told him, ah, my friend, we have received thousands of those ones. Relax, you'll be okay. You know, it's painful. That is part of the pain of being a spiritual parent. Yeah. And it always, people think it's easier than it is. But no, Christ does not desire any should perish. I am convinced that what God has in this church is beautiful and good. And here's my, my other conviction. I believe what God is doing in Mavuno now is not for Mavuno. 20, 2005, when God gave me the vision for Mizizi and all that, it was a huge culture change. Massive. It was a departure from where we had come from in the church that sent me to plant. And I remember so many people were just not with it, not happy. People we moved with, some of them moved back to Nairobi Chapel, were just, this is not the way. 
But God gave me the conviction and said, stay the course because this is for the body of Christ. And today, many of the churches in this city, many churches in the world are doing the things that we were seen as very radical then. They've become normal. And I don't say that to take any credit. It's just that I felt the, the wind of the Spirit is moving. I need to be with this wind. And it's not a Mavuno thing. Can I say this, Mavuno? What we are going through right now is not for Mavuno. Everyone I talk to pastors, there's a hunger. People know church is not working the way it's constituted to work. Having a church of 10,000 attenders that you feed a sermon every Monday, uh, every Sunday, and then you leave them to meet in the week to discuss the sermon and then come back and hear another sermon, it's not working. And my conviction is in the next 5, 10 years, the church you're going to go to will be going through this season. And so for me, I'm like, why not be a pioneer and stick it through? Let's stay and walk the journey. Let's stay and be faithful to the Lord and see what the Lord will do through us. So that will be my heart for any one of the people who's struggling. Let's ask the questions. Come, let's reason together. And one of the things that I'm planning to do, so this coming um, um, month, I'm going to be at downtown. And I'm going to be preaching there. And every Sunday afterwards, I'm going to be meeting their leaders, their DG leaders, and just having conversations with them. I may not be able to have this conversation with the whole congregation, but I will have it with their leaders. I'm hoping the next Monday, month that we can be in Hill City and do the same. And it's just saying, ask us anything. There are no bad questions. Whatever we can answer, we will seek to answer. But the thing is, don't give up too quickly. It's like marriage. Those who, who, who give up on their marriage will come back and tell you very quickly. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody. I was counseling somebody. And, and, and they told me, what do I do in a situation, a marriage situation, where I have every right to walk out? And I looked around and I saw one of my daughters who actually was in that situation years ago and did that. And today, if you ask her, she'll tell you. The first thing she said is, don't walk out. I'll tell you why. In other words, I know I've done it. It, 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 it seemed like the natural thing to do. But now in hindsight of 20 years down the road, 17 years down the road, I can tell you there are options. And I think it's the same thing with the church. The first thing sometimes people do is, ah, I'm gone. But I think somebody down the road might tell you, please don't. Uh, stick in there. This is your family. You'll go to another family like you do to another wedding, and then another marriage, and then you're going to start all over from scratch. And you're going to have to make the same mistakes to get to the same place that you're in right now. Why do that? Stick with your family. Um, I want to say uh, this one was a good question. I'm more mature in age and salvation than my pastor. <laughs> And I, and I actually have other spiritual parents. I come to the church because I like it and I serve wholeheartedly. Must I really call this pastor my spiritual parents? My pastor does not act like a spiritual parent. They have issues. <laughs> All the pastors are looking down. Gosh. Must you really expose me like this? Are they really qualified to be my spiritual parents just because Mavuno appointed them as my campus pastors? By the way, I love the realness of this question. Can I choose my spiritual parents from another campus as long as they're in the Mavuno movement? Because I've connected with them better and they check and care on me more than my own pastor. Ish. <laughs> pastor James. Uh, pastor James. <laughs> that, that, that sounds like a question for the senior pastor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> um, I, can, I, can, I can try. Okay, Pastor Mills will go first. <laughs> I can try. I think I feel the person. Because uh, I'm also very young. And uh, my spiritual parents are very old. So I can <laughs> he's, relate. He's saying he's older than us, by the way. That's what he actually means. That, that's what I mean. Actually, I am older than Pastor M, if you yeah. didn't know. Uh, um, yeah. I think it's very interesting when I look at that question because um, even in relation to this conversation and having served under two pastors who are both very far much younger than I, uh, Pastor Richard Chogo and Pastor Gowi Odera. Uh, in fact, for Gowi it was even worse because uh, when I was in campus, he was wearing shorts at Nairobi school. Uh, yeah, and he became my pastor. Um, I think there are several things to point out to this. One is understanding the set person over your life. The challenge with God's set person over your life may not look like 
it. Hmm. The set person may probably look childish, may look like their behaviors, uh, what you were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, they may look probably like you are, you, are, you are son or whatever because of your age. But it does not change that they are the set person over my life. And if I fail to align myself with the set person, the graces that are supposed to come to me because of misalignment will not flow to me. Remember, we've been taught that in the kingdom, wow, unity is vertical. This set person first does not bring just his graces. This person first brings the graces that come from Pastor Time and Pastor Carol. Am I making sense? There is a gate in Makadara of a, a, a redeemed gospel church. And at the gate, there's a huge poster that says the name of the pastors. And then they say, serving under the graces of Archbishop Arthur Kitonga. What this person is saying at that gate is when you enter this gate, it's not this pastor's graces you are going to find. It is the graces of the Archbishop Arthur Kitonga you are finding. Am I making sense? Now, when you misalign yourself then, because your pastor looks younger, then the graces of the house are the things that you will miss. Wow. You'll be home in quotes, but you are a squatter. And the inheritance that should have come to you that are ancient of the house coming from Pastor Iman and Pastor Caro, you will miss them because now for you, it is this person you are looking at thinking it is what they bring that they offer you. Wow. If... If in a lineage you are struggling from sins of your fathers and your forefathers, if the blessings are for thousands of generations, then guys, imagine the blessings for the generations that would have come to you that you would have missed out because you saw the set person as inadequate or inappropriate to lead you. Wow. So good. You know, it's interesting. Uh, thank you. Let's appreciate Pastor Milton. Let me invite uh, somebody had asked about Pastor Chris twice. Is he here? Chris, just stand. I want to ask my good uh, gentleman, Ulam Wajana, the young man. Is he here? Please stand up, sir. Please stand up with, with him. Why I want them to stand is because that young man in a heart is 75 years old. And yesterday, he introduced and said, I am a son of Pastor Chris, who is 30 years old. He said, I could have, I have, his own biological children are younger than Pastor Chris. But because he has received wisdom, he has received wisdom from God, he's able to understand it is because of this young man who is younger than my children that I am in the kingdom and God is allowing me to flow in the graces of this house. So I'm just illustrating what Pastor Milton, and I really thank you, sir, because even for me yesterday, just seeing the illustration, I could say it by theory, but I think for the person asking the question, I want you to see that man and to see, he says, if not for this pastor, I would not be here. There are things I've prayed for for, for a long time, all my life that have happened because of this young man who has been my pastor. So thank you so much. May God bless you, pastor. And may God bless you, young man. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's appreciate them, please. Amen. You know, it's interesting because in the army, you never salute somebody because of their age. Yeah, you don't. You never say, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm 50 and I'm a sergeant and a lieutenant walks in who's from college and he's 35. 
and you say, I cannot salute because I'm old. I think anybody in the army understands that rank is not an issue of age. By the way, not even of experience. It is an issue of commissioning by a higher authority. And I want to say that just the same way you didn't choose your church, you did not choose your pastor. If you come to Hill City, God chose Pastor James to be your spiritual father. You didn't choose it. And in the same way as Jesus said, you know, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Uh, in the same way, you didn't choose your DG leader because the DG leader was chosen by Pastor James. And that DG leader was actually given grace by Pastor James to lead you. And by you disconnecting from that, you actually disconnect. Because some people say, why can't I come to Pastor M directly? Why can't I come to Pastor James directly? Because they're more my age. You know, I'm married. They even know marriage issues. I don't think that's the way the kingdom of God works. You can find mentors and people to help you with marriage issues. But in the area of spiritual authority, in the area of the person who God has called to pray for you in this season, that young person, who is much less experienced than you in prayer, is the person God will use to liberate you and to bring answers to those prayers that you are praying. It's just the mystery of the kingdom. I don't understand it. But that's how God works. Yeah? That's how God works. Um, I want to just uh, move into this one, which I think is also a very good one. Um, is it dangerous to commission people you haven't trained for a significant length of time to be leaders? Uh, and another question that was very similar, it said, uh, why does Mavuno make pastors from newbies? Where is a place for development and maturity? Uh, since last year, the topic of church planting has been an ongoing conversation. Someone now can just come from the congregation to being a campus pastor with in a, in, in, <laughs> zero to 100 uh, in 10 seconds. How is that sustainable, and where is the place for step-by-step -step progression? Um, can I answer that one? Yes. I really like that one. I think one of the things, in fact, I remember when I went to Mavuno South, one, somebody asked me that question, because that's a place I've been and sat with the, with the leaders. At the time, last year, I went to Mavuno South and spent from 10 o'clock in the morning till 4 in the afternoon in a forum like this with the leaders. Um, and one of the leaders asked the question, why are you taking young people? And turning them into leaders, turning them into pastors. And I said, there's something that happened a long time ago for me. In 20, um, 2019, Mavuno moved from the sports club, our first venue, and moved to the Bellevue, uh, 209, uh, moved to 208, yeah, moved to uh, Bellevue, our second venue. And we grew in one month from 400 people to 1,600 people. And in the next month, we became 2,400 people. And I know those numbers are just numbers. But anybody who's a campus pastor understands the headache that causes. And I remember at that point, we just had to say, we're in a revival. I cannot wait until I train theologically all these people. And so what we'll do is take Mizizi, we graduate you, and we put people under you for you to take, to take through Mizizi. And I reminded the leader who asked that question, you are one such person. You are not qualified. And I say to them, that time, people asked me, why am I letting young leaders like you to disciple people? And I said, I had one answer. I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing, guys. I know the Bible says, be careful not to lay on hands. There's offices and all that. I get that. I get that. But I remember when I look at the example of the Apostle Paul, he went from town to town, preached. Some places he didn't even stay as long as he hoped. He was chased out. But he left a church there, and he went. Hence the New Testament. Have you noticed the whole New Testament is crisis communication? <laughs> is Paul writing and asking people, how is someone sleeping with his father's wife? What can... And then he asked, who bewitched you people? It's like every book has some crisis. Why? Because he left young leaders, and they were messing up. They were making mistakes because they didn't know. But the beautiful thing is, they were his disciples. So they had a, a way that he could correct them. And I think for me, that's what I'm saying in this season. The church is growing fast. We need to have disciples. Um, the people that God appoints are not always the people that have appointed, but that's how the Holy Spirit works. The only safeguard I have is to make sure that if Pastor Irene starts a church in Diani, that she's a disciple of Pastor Victor. And that there's somebody who's watching over her soul, who is praying for her, who's caring for her. Does that make sense? If Pastor Ray starts in 360... Pastor Mike is there as a spiritual father. So there's a sense in which if he, if he's not, if he, if he, if he needs help, Pastor Mike can jump in. If my, Pastor Mike is overwhelmed, Pastor Kilonz is there. If Pastor Kilonz is overwhelmed, I'm there. 
if I'm overwhelmed, <laughs> I have a bishop, I can go to and ask for help, you know. But the question is, is the person under discipleship? And I feel like that's the biggest safeguard for us. It may look like we've just appointed somebody, but our desire, our plan, our structure is that every single pastor is being discipled by another pastor. And that's where your safeguard comes from. And so I think for me, I've just come to understand the Holy Spirit can do things I couldn't. The other thing I've also realized is if you look at, churches, at, at the history of church movements, church movements always grew the fastest without formal institutions. And then what happens at some point is they begin to say, okay, now we are mature, we have money, let's build a theological seminary. And then they say, you cannot be appointed a pastor until you have three years degree and you have served for four years in internship in another church and you have a qualification. Isn't that the churches we grew up in? And when you look at church history, every time the church does that, the growth slows down. It enters into a space of maintaining and stagnation. Because now I feel like what God's people are doing, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with training. By the way, we train. It's just that what we've decided to do is we're going to train practically. We're going to train need-based training. We're going to train in response to the situation. And we're going to get better and better. Those of you who are here for the launch of the Fearless Institute, you could tell we've gotten a bit better than we were last year. Isn't it? We are always improving. We are always growing. And I think that's a sign of life. So my sense is, don't be afraid. Yes, we will put people who are overwhelmed. I remember when I was first asked to preach a sermon at Nairobi Chapel, I was just freshly graduated from college, and Bishop Oscar told me to preach a whole month uh, in Nairobi Chapel. I beat my nails until they were halfway, and they were bleeding all of them. I mean, literally, my pillow was just covered with blood, because that's how I'd I was so nervous. Uh, but he told me, you're going to do it. And I, he trusted the Holy Spirit. And he told me, you're not preaching one, you're preaching four. He had never heard me preach before. Hey, praise God for Pastor Oscar. I hated preaching, but here I am today. Amen? So I think it's just being able to say, don't be afraid. I believe we have to trust the Holy Spirit. If this is a movement of the Holy Spirit, it will stand. And that for me has been my posture the whole time. Yeah, yeah go ahead and add something, Pastor Caro. I'll um, get to the next question. Yes, and then we'll, we'll be summarizing because of lunch, but... Yeah. yeah, I think uh, for that question, maybe um, uh, the person may not be aware that, uh, of the kind of trainings that are happening. I think for every network over here, all churches, even those new church planters uh, are all trained. I think um, every, I, I know many campuses for Pastor uh, James over here, he does trainings six weeks every season. He's meeting his leaders every season. I think you do yours once a month or something like that. So every network has what they call leaders day. So I don't know if you're aware of that. We did a church planting 101 where we gathered all those people and took them through training. In fact, how many of us went through that? There's quite a number there. That's your wow. witness. Those are the people who went through that. And so that is ongoing. So I think... Boot camp, yeah. you talked about yeah, boot camp as well. uh, is a one year program where um, for people who signed up last year have been invited to the one year training. But it's as you're doing the work, uh, you know, that is what so is instead happening. of saying you have to do boot camp to plant a church, yeah. we say plant the church and then come and we tra will train you as you're planting. Yeah. And I think that's just the beauty of trust in the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad I trusted Pastor, the Holy Spirit when he told me to appoint Pastor Irene, Ooh. who had no experience in leading a church. And because of her, Many lives have been changed in Diani, and not just her, but many, many others of these leaders. God is using them in fresh ways. Uh, and I think that when they don't know, they're even more desperate for God than those who think they know. Uh, they pray. She, pray. she spends hours in prayer because she knows I need God. You know, I, I suspect Pastor Ray spends hours, hours more in prayer than he ever has because he just knows I'm not qualified. That's a good thing for your pastor, by the way, as opposed to getting a self-confident pastor who feels he knows the Holy Spirit. Uh, amen, somebody. Amen. <laughs> amen. Pastor Lynn, you're going to say something. You're just saying amen. Amen. All right. I think we need to conclude. By the way, that time has flown fast. Like, how is that that you guys have... It's almost like family night. It's, there's never enough time. Somebody asked about uh, family night. Why do we, in DG, have to watch the broadcast and then discuss, since it's the same thing that was taught on Sunday? <laughs> And then Pastor James will answer that one. Then the other one that I wanted answered, my question is on fast fruits. Kindly explain the basics of it. So I know it's not tithe. Why are we contributing a whole month's salary? I want to understand because I've been battling the question since I joined Mavuno. Pastor Kev can answer that one. All right. I can answer the family. 
Oh, you also want to answer family night? Uh, for, yeah, okay, for, go for it. Oh, yeah. uh, for me, it's simple. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That repetition, God did not make a grammatical error. It's in the scriptures for a reason. Hearing and hearing the word of God. That's how your faith grows. I think to add on to that is if you're not discipling ev anyone, everything we are doing is repetition. So if you're not discipling anyone, you want new content to new, you know, just because it's new, but you haven't done it, you haven't passed it on. But if you're discipling someone, they hear it on Sunday, they pray over it through the week, because now the word becomes a prayer life. They hear it on Wednesday, you discuss, guys, where have you not done what was taught on Sunday? Uh, and then now you are expecting them to be able to pass that on as well. So if you're, if you're not working with anyone, the reality is that it feels like a repetition. Now, if you're working with someone and you're convicted that this is God's word, then that conversation gives you a fresh perspective on how to enable your disciple apply the word that has already been shared. So that, I think wow. that's a major wow. difference. It's about repetition. Yeah. Discipleship is reputation. Yeah. Actually, I've found that the more I listen to a message, because scripture tells us that we must hear the word, we must read the word, we must me memorize the word, we must meditate. Meditate, the word for meditate in the scripture is the word that is, it's, 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 you mull over, it's what a cow does, it just regurg regurgitates and just chews the card. It ruminates over the word. And what it means is that I must take the same word I learned on Sunday, and chew over it. Some people took offense, by the way, when I said, don't listen to other pastors out there. There are too many teachers on YouTube. Listen to Pastor M. And people said, are you trying to exalt yourself? Guys, that's not the point. I'm not saying that Pastor Fatik cannot build you. And I'm not saying he doesn't have good content. I really believe he's an inspired man of God and I have great respect for him. I, I believe that uh, uh, some people might not, but I believe that Apostle Joshua Selman, he's an incredible teacher. Every time, I mean, he's such an amazing teacher. But here's the thing I've come to understand. We are responsible for the word we receive. That should be a very scary thing for you. Because the minute you hear it, God holds you accountable for it. So think about how you've heard Bishop T.D. Jakes on Monday, Apostle, Apostle Selman on Tuesday, uh, Steve Fatik on Wednesday, Benny Hinn on Thursday. And you know, the thing is, Every one of these words, God does not want you to be a hearer. He wants you to be a doer. But guess what happens? You have too much word. You can't do it all. Because you've not learned the discipline of meditating. And what the whole point of this thing is to say, guys, pick your teacher. If you're in Stephatic's church, join Stephatic's church. Don't be in two places. Uh, go online and just be an online member. Stop pretending to be in Mavuno. Listen to him. Chew his sermon. Take the sermon on Sunday. Listen to it two, three times that week. It will build you because now you've joined a house and you're receiving the inheritance of the house. If you're in Mavuno, don't take five words. Take this word on Sunday. By the way, my, my encouragement is even before you come for, fa for family night, listen to it as on, 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 as on the podcast or on YouTube before family night. Yeah. Then come on family night and listen at that time. By the way, I can promise you, try that for a month and you will come back and you have seen the difference something will begin. The word begins to bear fruit in your life in a very powerful way. The seed that is being planted, it just, you'll just start to see fruit coming out that you've never seen before when all you are was an educated Christian. God never gave us his word to educate us. He gave it to us to transform us. Yeah? So I, I, I think for me that would be my encouragement. Uh, can I say something about fast fruits? Oh, Pastor I was going to oh. say something. Oh, you want to say something about and fast fruits? Yeah, so that I don't speak after you. No, no, speak about fast fruit. Please, <laughs> please, please. I need someone to speak yeah. about fast fruit. Um, uh, I struggled with this fast fruit conversation. Uh, so probably you can, you can be able to connect with me, the person who asks because of your struggle. Yeah. Uh, I was out on sabbatical when the decision was made uh, by the team. So when I came back, we were giving the first month salary. And by that time, my wife was in hospital. Oh, wow. we, we had huge bills. And my big question was, why am I being asked to give my whole salary when I already have nothing? And it was not until I re-listened to Pastor M's teaching and read uh, uh, Apmo's uh, The Principles and Practice uh, of Honor that this thing clicked. And this is how it clicked for me, because um, 
God, God's throne is founded on justice and righteousness. So if God is a just God, he does not desire to have some poor people and some very rich people. It would not be his nature, isn't it? And if righteousness is the other pillar, then it means if God has said, be fruitful, multiply, increase, subdue, and walk in authority, then if you're not walking in it, then God is not walking in right standing with his word. And if it was depending on your intelligence, on your wisdom, on your ability to have been exposed to economic books, some whatever uh, education, then God would be technically unfair. So God gives us some very simple instruction. Give the first fruit of your produce. And when you do so, Proverbs uh, 3, 9. And when you do so, your barns will be filled. And whatever you need, you do not need those vats of wine they will also be filled. So what God is doing here in his economics, he's saying whether you are thick or brilliant, as long as you can give your first fruit, there's a promise of filled up buns. Okay, you guys are not hearing. You see, if it was dependence on what you know, who you know, how you know it, man, that's different. So whether you earn 10 bob or a million, whether you earn 50 bob or a thousand shillings, God is saying, just give first fruit of your produce and I will fill up your buns. Now, the thing is this, because God is so righteous and he's so kind to us, he makes it a free will offering so that it is you who chooses. It is you who chooses. Now, when you choose to go along with it, then you will see your buns filled. So, I gave then my first fruit. Um, someone gave me land. This year, I have given my first fruit. I was counting with someone yesterday, and this just blew my mind. It's because it was super crazy. Um, I gave in my first fruit, and... In just the month of January, the monies that I had received from even unexpected sources per se was 215,000 shillings on my phone. Wow. My phone only. Wow. What am I saying, guys? You choose whether it would work or you choose whether it wouldn't. But the race is not for the swift. Yeah. The battle is not for the strong. Time and chance happens to them all. You can chance on this time where God has invited you to give your first fruit and then just see what he will do because he's a promise-keeping God. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Milton. That's a really good, good um, answer. And I will say, guys, I mean, if you were not here yesterday, my... I'd say apart from a more session, yesterday afternoon session was my other favorite one. Because we had a whole afternoon. Just watch that one. Because I had a whole afternoon where we taught one another. We had about uh, 20 preachers. Uh, the first sermon we've had in Mavuno with 20 preachers. And it was interesting because God, people just shared their experience with the first fruits. I would encourage you to listen to it. It's not an obligatory uh, offering, and I, we emphasize that. But I believe God calls us to radical generosity. And many times, we never get into that radical generosity because it's a scary thing unless someone is willing to challenge us into it. There's some things you'll never do unless a parent challenges, challenged you to do them. Um, and when you do them, you realize, wow, it's an incredible thing. Pastor Caro and I have given our fast fruits for many years, long before we taught it in Mavuno. And... When we became spiritual parents, <laughs> I think Pastor James talked earlier, when you become a spiritual parent, you start realizing, my God, there are things I'm doing in my life that I've taken for granted and privatized for me that are not for me. The lessons God taught us are actually for his people. And it's because it's an inheritance. And I realize I need to teach you what we do and what God has taught us about his nature. And so we always give our fast fruit. And it's not even something we think about 
And God has been super faithful. Listen to those morning. I could never get as powerful stories as what people shared yesterday. Let me conclude by saying this. We want to go for lunch. But before that, let me say this. Culture change is the hardest thing a leader can ever do. And my prayer is you would be gracious with us. We are not perfect. We as your leaders are seeking our best to be faithful to Jesus. Will we make mistakes? Yes, we will. If we were, if we were Jesus, we wouldn't, but we, we will. Even Joshua made mistakes, and he fell on his knees, and he cried to the Lord the whole day, and the Lord told him, why are you crying on your knees? There is your people, you people have disobeyed my commands. So if Joshua could make a mistake, so can we. So can we. His mistake was he was overconfident. He didn't pray about going to battle against AI. We can make mistakes. But anywhere you go, any leader you follow will be human. Because Jesus has asked you to follow a human being. Making disciples implies that Jesus himself is not making disciples. The work of humans is to make disciples. The work of Jesus is to build the church. I never, before that, I used to focus a lot on building the church until I realized that's not my job. Jesus builds the church. I make disciples. And so as we're making disciples, if we make mistakes, forgive, be gracious, just like you would with other, in other contexts, your parents at home. Don't assume the worst. In fact, assume the best. Assume maybe we were deluded. Ask the questions. I want to ask, she said, there are questions we've not been able to answer. Take your question if it's not been answered and send it to your campus pastor. And allow the conversation to start there. And just ask anything. And if they don't know, campus pastor, don't front. <laughs> don't pretend you know if you don't know. Ask your disciple. Ask your network leader. And network leader, if you don't know, ask me. And if I don't know the answer, we'll go back down the chain. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Why don't you pray and tell us? Because there are questions, by the way, that are asked and I don't know. And they're not even questions that I should know. Somebody might ask me, what do we do with single moms? Uh, how do we minister to them? And I say, I don't know. Are you a single mom? You have a better answer than me. Come, let's reason together. You tell me what you want us to do for single. You know what I'm saying? We as your pastors don't have all the answers. If we make a mistake and hurt you, Let's follow the Matthew 18. That's one of the messages that we talked about here. And we said there's a biblical process. Again, Pastor Godwin talked about that. But let's be gracious with each other. We are a family. The more we love each other, the more the opportunity for us to hurt each other. But the option is for us to become isolated, sad, fruitless Christians. That's the option to family. It's for you to be an isolated, sad, fruitless Christian. And there's no reward in that. None of us wants to be that. So we must take the risk of love. We must take the risk of family. We must take the risk of fighting for what God has called us to as a movement. And I want to tell you God's people, if as one people, doing the same thing, speaking the same language, we start to follow God together, Genesis 11:6, nothing will be impossible for us. Nothing will be impossible for us. This last 21 days, as we prayed. I've no doubt what Pastor, God, uh, Pastor James was talking about. I've no doubt there was a fire going forth from Mavuno into heaven because we are agreed as one person. When we went with the ex exec team to the prayer mountain and we prayed as, an exec, as, 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 a, as a discipleship group, I've no doubt that power was released in great ways in all our families and in all our churches because we agreed as one person. And I believe that this is what the enemy wants to destroy and this is what we must fight for with all our hearts. I'm so proud of this family. I'm so proud of the sons of this family. I'm so incredibly proud of the daughters of this family. I believe that God has raised, we, you've seen on this stage this, this week, the kind of people God is raising. Uh, Paul says, not all of you are wise by human standards. Not all of you could have stood on the pulpit of your church that you grew up in. Amen. Yeah, you, you, it's have taken you a lot of years and theological college to, to be qualified. But did you see the power of the Holy Spirit as man after man, woman after woman just led us in prayer this week and to God be the glory. Let's trust the Holy Spirit. Let's walk this journey because I believe what is ahead of us is far greater than anything behind us. And the last thing I'll say is for those of you who know people in Mavuno who left Mavuno, who even went to another church and they're backbenching somewhere or maybe even not in a church, they're at home. Hey, be that woman with her lost coins. Let's look for that. This is a year when God is going to bring prodigals back home. 
I fully believe it. This is a year for prodigals to return. And so have a heart for them, pray for them. Let's call them back. Let's walk this journey. Let none of us backslide. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Come on, somebody give glory to Jesus. We bless you, Lord.